today is Proactive Driver Retention, presented by our special guest speakers, Amanda Gallagher and Kelly Anderson. My name is Kent Ferguson, Director of Transportation Solutions for HireRight, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar session. The presentation was prepared for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please tweet using hashtag HireRightWebinar during the live webinar session. The most engaged Twitter participant will receive an exclusive thank you package from HireRight. We will not be providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email tomorrow with a link to the recorded session that you can share with your team. If you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F, as in Frank, 5, on your keyboard, or let us know through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We will take questions at the conclusion of the webinar. To type your question, click the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these during the webinar, but if we run out of time, we will follow up with an answer later via email. After the presentation, we would appreciate getting your feedback, so please take our short survey. Let us know if this session was valuable and if you have any ideas for future topics. Our guest speakers for today's session are Kelly Anderson, President, Impact Solutions, and Amanda Galagos, Director of Risk Management for Stewart Transportation. Kelly has worked in the transportation industry for the past 27 years. The positions he has held include federal law enforcement officer, professional driver, driver trainer, driver recruiter, safety supervisor, and safety manager over a recruiting department for a 1,720 truck fleet. Using these experiences, Kelly founded Impact in January of 1998. Kelly is the chairman of the American Trucking Association's Driver Recruitment, Driver Retention, and Driver Wellness Committee. He is an adjunct instructor for two colleges and is on the board of directors for the Missouri Trucking Association. Amanda has served as the director of risk management for Stewart Transportation for the past seven years. Stewart is a transportation company that's based in Phoenix, Arizona. As a third-generation transportation professional, she has seen her family successfully thrive in the trucking industry. After spending eight years in HR management, her career naturally gravitated toward an industry that has always been part of her life, transportation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Kelly? Kent, thank you so much. And folks, we're seeing a few comments about audio issues. Hopefully you're hearing me loud and clear. And uh, Kent, I don't take it lightly, uh, and nor does Amanda. Amanda, how are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's exciting to do, to do this presentation, folks, because it's on proactive retention techniques. And what is, is more important than finding drivers and retaining drivers um, today in our industry, and we just can't find <clears throat> we just can't find enough um, enough drivers, and we can't re replace them as fast as, as people can lose them. So Amanda has agreed to to share what Stewart Transport did to to lower their turnover rate by frankly 50 percent since January of this year. So the things that we're going to talk about today are things that you can can implement immediately and start making a difference. And, and Amanda, you know, as we talked about getting started on this project, there was really some concerns that you folks had at, at Stewart before you even started 
as to whether you know on whether you wanted to start this project, what would happen? Could you share some of of that before you even got started on the project? Sure. What concerns did you have? Sure. Well, our biggest concern, probably like a lot of uh, people on this call, was that we we thought that recruiting and retention specifically was just an HR problem, that it wasn't a company-wide problem. So we had one department that was kind of spinning its wheels about how to fix a company-wide problem. Um, obviously, we, how how was I going to have the mechanics buy into this? How was I going to have the dispatchers buy into this? when everyone was kind of viewing it as this is an HR problem. Um, so our biggest thing was how are we going to get people who are already busy, who are already overworked, who are already training kind of our revolving door of drivers, how are we going to get them to buy into this program? When are we going to find the time to do it? Absolutely. And so how did you overcome the, the, you know those concerns? Well, um, we kind of just sat down and said, look, we are spending time training new drivers every single week. And that's kind of the revolving door. So we made a choice. We can either spend the time training these new drivers or we can spend the time keeping the drivers that we had. So that's when I called you and I said, <laughs> help. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she did. And, um, you know, the problem with most, most retention efforts is they start – once a driver says, I'm going to quit, and once that happens, it's it's, it's already too late. You're behind right. the eight ball. Yep. Yeah. So when you guys started, uh, tell us about the statistics. Where were we at? Um, so we are we have 103 drivers currently. When I called you and we started this program, our turnover rate was at 76%, which was obviously completely unacceptable um, for our company. So, um, you know, we're a refrigerated freight company. We run um, over the road, mostly Western 11, uh, multi-stops. So we're not, you know, we don't have a, a, a lot of dedicated lanes. You know, we're not, um, the drivers aren't, you know, getting home every night. Um, so we struggle. We're, it's, it's a hard demographic to get. Um, so we knew that we had to do something, and um, that's when we made the decision to, to go with this program. So your current turnover rate, as you're looking at 12-month rolling average, is 48%. But yes, since the correct. seminar, you've actually lowered your turnover rate to, to what is it today? So today, starting from the beginning of the seminar to today, it's at 39%. And um, like I was telling you before, this time last year, we were at almost 80% turnover. So wow. we've had a huge, huge impact on, on keeping drivers over the last uh, 12 months for sure. Good deal. And, you know, I, I think, and, and actually it's up a little bit from where it was a month ago. You lost a couple of drivers, mm -hmm. and so that negatively impacted. I think we all know uh, come Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, drivers don't like to quit, so we ought to see that dip again, dip down. And, of course, with all the proactive things that we're about to get into, uh, we should have an opportunity to not see that huge influx that typically happens um, around you know January or so, and so starting to get into you know proactive um, communication. One thing that I have found as, as I go around the country and work with, with fleets, you know, people call me Kelly. I've got a ton of empty trucks, or I've got you know my turnover rate is a hundred and some odd percent. And one thing I find is an absolute common denominator. And anybody that's heard me talk in the past, you've never. I've just started making this statement the last few months because it. it dawned on me, frankly, um, or dawned on me enough to, to make it a part of a talking point. But an absolute common denominator of fleets that call me and say, I have man, high turnover, lots of empty truck, low productivity, even low profitability, is people don't know the number. Maybe the vice president of operations knows the number. Maybe the president, you know, the president knows the number. But does everybody in your organization know the number? Our folks cannot hit a target that they can't see. So, you know, when you when you ask, hey, how do we define success? Well, well, let's say we define success by having, you know, less than two percent empty trucks. Okay having a productivity of this, having a profitability of, of no more than 91% OR. You know, when you set those things out there as this is how we define success 
and then you provide the numbers to people, and you provide, hey, these are the things we have to do to 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 accomplish it. Now everybody can get on 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 board and help us to do that. If they don't know the number, all they're doing is coming coming in, going through the motions every single day, and they're not driving the company forward. And that's one thing that I think uh, you're going to talk about the transparency. Folks at Stewart know the number. And as a result, there we are. Go ahead and take over, Amanda. Sure. So um, we started we started these emails in January after we um, met with Kelly, and everyone from the guy that changes tires on our trailer all the way up to the CEO gets the same email every week, and it has what our turnover number is, what our goals are set for, and then we openly discuss if we lost any drivers. Um, you know, we keep it. We keep it confidential to what the drivers are, but everything is transparent. If we lost a driver that week, you know, we, we state it so everybody knows somebody left. Um, the other thing that we do is we, we bring an action item into that week, and we, we try and keep people focused on something. Um, a lot of them are obviously action items from your seminar. That's probably, um, you know, the biggest thing that we do. Sometimes they're about leadership. Sometimes they're about communication. Sometimes they're about stress management. just kind of depends. But what has happened and what has kind of evolved over the last couple of months is that now now that everyone knows that they're getting this email and everyone's on track and everyone can see exactly what we're doing, I have department managers coming up to me and saying, hey, you know, um, I noticed that some of my staff, they're not not stopping what they're doing at their desk and, and, you know, peeling themselves away from the computer when a driver walks up. Can you put an action item in there to remind them, stop what you're doing when you're talking to a driver? Um, we've had some pretty good policies that have just kind of evolved. One of them is that we don't like we don't allow drivers to go to voicemail, um, and it's been a really good thing because, you know, we got a guy out on the road. He's frustrated. He's in front of that windshield. He calls because he's ready to talk to somebody, and then they say, "Oh, she's not here. Um, let me put you through to her voicemail." We don't do that anymore. We say, "Oh, okay, hold on. Here, what, um, you know, what's your problem? Let me see if I can get you in front of another manager." So all of that stuff kind of wraps back up in the email because they know, like, hey, we're going to be held accountable for this, and we need to make sure that, you know, we're hitting our targets, and this is what we're doing to hit our targets. And when you're talking about the action items, uh, one thing that, that happens – um, you know, during during the seminar, and folks, we we do not mean this to sound any in any way like like an infomercial. Uh, we're just sharing with you what we did, um, and you know whether um, one thing about it, whether whether it's turnover, recruiting, uh, you know, all sorts of life experiences. Find out what successful people are doing and replicate what they did, and you get to start from where they're at, not where somebody or where you are currently. And so Amanda is gracious enough here to share how Stuart uh, has done this. And so all you have to do is replicate it. So, um, But one thing that we did during the seminar is uh, created action items. And there's like 30 some odd of them. I'm actually working to create 50 of them, you know, one for every week of the month. But you know, you can separate those in life skills, uh, interpersonal skills, business skills, directly to retention. And you know, one of those is I will not multitask. One of the most what she's talking about there when somebody walks up to the desk, and, and there's two there's two principles tied up to the walking up to the desk situation. Number one, I am going to immediately acknowledge the person that walked up to my desk. You know how odd and how how uncomfortable it feels to walk up to somebody's desk and that person keep working on what they're working on and not even acknowledge that you're that you're there? Hey, if you can't even if it's a hand signal that is you know you kind of you're on the phone, like I'm on the phone with you guys right now, if somebody walked up and I would I would be like, you know, hey you know, I'm on the phone, have a seat. You know, I'd give them some sign language that they're acknowledged and they can have a seat. Uh, the other um, very disrespectful thing that most that lots of people do is they think they can multitask while somebody else is talking to them. Folks, if you just Google multitasking 
And matter of fact, if you want to Google multitasking is worse than a lie, uh, there's an exercise you can do, and we did that. And it just shows that when you try to multitask, it actually takes you longer to do what you're trying to do, and you make mistakes. So literally, when, I, when somebody applies to me and they put on their resume, and everybody puts it on their resume, hey, I'm a prolific multitasker. I've told several people, I appreciate your honesty on your resume. What you've just told me is that if I hire you, you will take longer to do what the person before you did, and you'll make lots of mistakes while you do it. And they're like, excuse me? <laughs> so Google multitasking, and let's stop the lie that people can multitask. You know, when we talk we to talk about proactive retention techniques, one, you know, number one and number two reason for turnover in our industry is lack of appreciation and lack of respect. Folks, I highly recommend get, go to. I just did it. I, I, re, I went to Del Carnegie 30 years ago. Well, I just went to our local library, or frankly, I, my wife did for me. <laughs> Thank you, Carmen. Anyway, went to the local library. And she, she got the audio for Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Highly recommend it. And what, you know, one of the things it talks about in there is, is a, a leading, a leading um, need of folks is, is the need to feel important. How do we make people feel important? Well, we show specific and genuine appreciation to them. Uh, how do we get people to do what we need them to do? Well, let's reward the behavior that we want. So when we see the behavior we want, let's say thank you for doing that. Um, when, when somebody walks up, how do you make them feel important? The most valuable thing you can give another person is your undivided attention. And the truth is, I cannot read one message, type an answer, and listen to this person at the same time. I don't care how old you are, and I don't care what sex you are. It is proven that at that is neurologically impossible. Google it. We've got to stop this lie in our industry. And it just drives a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, and it drives a lot of turnover as well. Make, make folks feel important. And, and while I'm on the Dale Carnegie thing for, for a moment, and you listen to the audio, it, it's easy to listen to, and it, it'll make sense to you. Um, you know, people have heard me talk about management and leadership. Uh, Man, our ability to communicate well and get along well with others is direct. We have, will have a direct impact in our success. And when you look in, in, in this course, if you listen to that course, you'll hear story after story of super successful people. And when you look back, um, you find that what, what did they have? What skill did they have? They had the, the ability to get along well and communicate well with others and make others feel important where others wanted to do great things for them. So when you look at your organization, success in getting people committed to you and wanting to do things for you and wonderful things for you and with you has nothing to do with super intelligence. It has a lot to do with your ability to effectively communicate with other people. So... Um, Sorry, Amanda, I just kind of went on a went on a ramp, but it really pulls all this in because those action items that that you every week you you do another action item. Here's another one: I will not shin kick. And the reason that I that, that I have an action item of I will not shin kick is I see people shin kicking all day long uh, at trucking companies. People shin kick recruiting, you know, orientation. Like, where in the world did you get this one? People in operations shin kick orientation to say, man, I don't know what they told you in orientation, but let me tell you how it really is. You know, oper safety and operations shin kick each, back, each other back and forth. You know, I liken it to a football team. How can we win our game if we're injuring our own team members? And when we badmouth each other across the office or across the, across the building or across the country, we start breaking down trust breaking down morale, and stop working together. And you know what? Here, here is something I have never said in a presentation before. And as I've been, you know, I do undercover trucker, where I get hired to go through orientations as a truck driver. And here's something else that I have found, whether it's in my undercover trucking experiences and or um, as I watch the behavior of many, of many trucking companies. You know one of the biggest leading causes of driver turnover in our industry is? People in trucking companies don't like truck drivers. What do you think about that, Amanda? 
yeah, I think that uh, we we really took that to heart when you said that um, I will not chin kick because, as everybody knows, it is hard to get that communication between the departments and, and have it be really unbiased, which obviously that's what the touch points are for, which I know we're going to talk about later, but, mm-hmm. but I, I agree. And But, you know, I find – did you find some people, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot on this one, and, and if not, then if it's not true for you, then it's great. But, you know, when I said some people don't like truck drivers, you know, they talk poorly of truck drivers, and then they treat them poorly. Right. Uh, I have, I have, I mean, I was physically assaulted in orientation by a safety director. Because, in, and he assumed, you know, I, I don't know if people in this call have heard this story, but I guess I'll, um, I will, um, Share it real quick. Uh, myself and seven seven other people finished everything that we were assigned to do bef- by 10:30. I mean the physical, the drug test, the road test, the backing test. Lots of people failed the failed the backing test at this particular company. Well, seven of us passed it all, and the orientation coordinator person says, "You seven can can grab everything we gave you, get everything that we gave you this morning, all your books, clear your desk off, and take it to your room because we're going to give you lots more this afternoon, and it'll be easier for you to carry it later." You know, if you don't have to carry this stuff from this morning, boom, man! I tell you what, we uh, we grabbed our stuff and left. Well, we come back at one o'clock when we're supposed to be there, and the safety director stands up and says, "All right, grab that black book we gave you this morning." Well, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I don't want to really be seen. I'm kind of trying to lay, play low flow here, you know. And the other guys didn't raise their hand out of fear, so I rose my hand finally and I said, "Sir, we were told to take our book." Uh, to our room this morning, so I don't have my black book. How many of you don't have that black book? Seven of us wrote, rose our hand. So he immediately immediately assumes that seven of us have made a mistake. It looks like seven of you don't know how to follow instructions. Get yourself to your room. Get your book. I walked up to him and said, sir, I can go to my room and get my book, but I'm not staying in your hotel. It'll be, I'll miss 20 minutes of this class if I do that. Do you have a book I can borrow? And give right back to you. And instead of walking around me, he walks through me and knocks me out of the way with his shoulder. And you know, but the truth is, I was one of the seven most qualified professional drivers he had in his class, and he just physically assaulted me. Um, you know, do we? And, and in the in the debrief of that particular company, I gave example after example of that. The president literally had water. I mean, he was almost to tears. Because he loves people. And, he, and he's thinking, how did I get here? How did my company get here where my folks don't love the people on my team? Folks, one of my principles that I talk about all the time, whether we're talking about drivers or we're talking about coworkers or other people you come in contact with. And I, and I, I, I lived this way when I did federal drug interdiction in the Coast Guard. I treat people based on who they are, not who somebody else was. That is probably one of the root of all evil that we have going on in trucking. Fleet managers treat drivers like other drivers were. Drivers treat their fleet managers like the other fleet managers they had before. We have got to clear that slate, and we're going to treat people based on who they are, not who somebody else was. So, Amanda, let's get into um, into the proactive touch points. So, we've, uh, we've you know you're sending the weekly emails. You're communicating every week. Guys, our goal is that we can't lose more than two drivers this week, and we've our turnover rate goal is to be at, you know, what X percent, and this is our current percent. And by the way, here's our action item for the week, kind of keep things alive. So that's an awareness company-wide, but you're also doing strategic touch points in order to um, to identify drivers with problems before those problems get so big that um, – that the driver decides he wants to quit. Can you tell us about that program? Sure, absolutely. So this this is really the the backbone of of the whole program for us, and um, there's a, a lot of uh, work that's put into it, but there's a lot of reward. And so it all starts with right before orientation, uh, we have our driver trainer. We we have a full time driver trainer that handles um, the orientation, and is with our driver all the way from when the recruiter you know passes them on. To his very to the end of his first load, basically. Um, so our driver trainer calls the driver, introduces himself, tells him, you know, look, we're excited to to be here. Um, 
you know, we can't wait for you to get here, kind of reminds him about stuff to bring, um, and um, just kind of overall welcomes him. Um, and then we go into orientation. So uh, we, you know, our practice is a two-day orientation. Um, we, we go through everything. Prior to having a driver trainer, we were having our managers do the orientation, which is obviously pretty time-consuming. Um, once we started this, we realized that we pushed the manager's work off into the other weeks of the touch points, which I'll talk about here in just, just a second. Um, so during orientation, um, after they're done with uh, the basic instructions and, and all that kind of good stuff, um, we set up a private meeting, uh, a private conversation between the driver manager um, and the driver. And the driver manager sits down, talks to him about expectations, like this is what we expect from you. Um, but at the same time, we hand them a sheet of paper that says, and this is what you can expect from us. And they have a pretty good one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, you know, it's not about, oh, hey, when are you ready for your first load? It's really personal, um, and, we, and we try and keep it that way. The other thing we do is we um, sit down with them and say, um, you know, hey, this year, what are important dates that you need to be home? Um, you know, do you, are you married? Do you have an anniversary that you want to be home for? Let's get it in the calendar today so you don't have to worry about it in July or, or whatever. Um, so we, we got a lot of good feedback from our new drivers with that because they're like, wow, I've never – I usually walk into dispatch and it's uh, not, hey, when, when do you want your first day off to be? It's when, when can you go out? So we've kind of changed that perspective Absolutely. Um, of the drivers, for sure. Do, do um, you feel like, you know, when I talked about, Amanda, do you feel like um, that helps to, to, to set that relationship? You know, when I talked about, you know, the driver treats the fleet manager like his past fleet manager or, and, and then fleet manager treats the driver like other drivers. Yeah. Doesn't that help to help? This is a person-to-person -person and create a relationship and commitment, so I treat you based on who you are, not who somebody else was. Absolutely, and that's exactly exactly what it does, um, absolutely. And that's really been a, a really big benefit, not only for our drivers, but kind of for our driver managers, because they, they can take a minute and just kind of have a breath and, and gauge the driver. Uh, you know, the other thing that the driver trainer does at the end of orientation is he sends an email out, you know, for each driver and he, and it's personalized and it's saying, Hey, you know, John, John's a great guy. He doesn't talk much. Um, or maybe he talks a lot. Um, it may seem really small, but those are the kind of things that our driver managers really do want to know because then they know how to communicate with the driver. If a driver is struggling with technology, I mean, we all know that, you know, the, we have older drivers that, you know, kind of kick around about all the new technology. So, we, we, day one, we're like, hey, driver manager, you know, John is not comfortable using the people net, so we're going to monitor him for a couple of weeks. So give him, you know, give him a little bit extra stock if he's not doing his loaded calls. Um, so we're kind of setting the expectations and kind of giving the driver manager really the tools that he needs to, like, properly communicate with the driver and not just assume that every driver is the same. Excellent. So, so what's your next phone call? Yeah. Yeah. So then um, after they've been here a week, um, then one of our uh, managers from our payroll department reaches out to the driver. And this has really been um, a big learning curve because um, drivers don't expect the county department, first of all, to call them. And um, what we do is we review the driver's pay stub with him, his very first paycheck. Um, we want to make sure that they can read it. Now, even though we go over that stuff in orientation, you know, we, they're in there for like 16 hours. So for them to remember which, you know, which line is the per diem payout, um, they don't remember. So it's really nice to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. So they, the payroll manager, you know, says, you know, do you understand your per diem pay? Um, I heard that you got detained and, you know, did you, um, send the detention request button and, you know, can you see on your paycheck? Here's where to look for it. Um, and is this, you know, what the recruiter told you that you were getting paid per mile, that type of stuff. So we don't wait, you know, six weeks from now and the guy quits and says, well, I was going to, you know, I was supposed to be paying X amount per mile and I'm not. We just, right from the get-go, we make sure that they're getting paid what they're supposed to. And making sure they understand it. Uh, yeah. You yeah. may be paying yeah, you may be paying what you said, but if they don't think you are, yeah, you're going to get a phone call. Right, right. And yeah, even excellent. I mean, it's even as simple as, 
you know, hey, you you know, you signed up for direct deposit. We just want to make sure you got it. So it's just um, it's a good way to to make contact. And then we've actually really kind of found out that once they have that connection, they're not really afraid to call if they do have questions on their paycheck. So if something doesn't seem right, sometimes, you know, our drivers will just be like, well, whatever. But then, it, you know, little things build up to a big mountain, right? But we, we've kind of broke that barrier of their contact with payroll. And so they can call and say, hey, is this right? Or can you help me with this? And they don't feel as intimidated. Excellent. Excellent. So then in week two, our um, director of maintenance reaches out and basically just talks about the truck. You know, how's your truck running? Um, uh, the biggest um, kind of concerns that we've seen over the last year are issues with computer codes, you know, sensors going off. And it seems so minimal that a guy's frustrated about, you know, this sensor that's going off every 30 minutes. But if, you know, he may not say anything, he may not even write it up on his DVR when he's supposed to. But if someone's calling and saying, hey, do you have any problems with your sensors? And, you know, is everything working on your truck? Do you understand how to use it? Um, that's our chance to grab it before it really kind of builds up to something else. Um, also, which I didn't mention in the beginning, this touch point email that goes, so th these touch points, they're all on one email. So as soon as orientation is done, our recruiter sends this email out, and then everyone replies all. So when, when by week two, when the shop manager has that email, he goes back through and looks to see what payroll, you know, what his notes are. Um, and if there's something on there that needed to be addressed, the manager picking up that week will say, hey, did you get your question answered or do you still have this issue? You know, can I help you? Has it been resolved? So it's been a, a learning curve because managers are asking about other departments, but it's kind of opened up a better uh, line of communication. So then we get into week three, which is um, a pretty important week for us. That's when the operations team reaches out to the driver. Most of the time, they're reviewing their routes. Um, you know, they're really checking to make sure that they're using their people net correctly and um, making sure that um, they're getting their detention pay when they're detained. We discuss any sort of upcoming home time request. Um, you know, we really kind of push home, home time, you know, all the Trucking companies out there say, oh, yeah, we give home time, we give home time. But we're constantly reminding them, hey, do you need home time? Is there any request you want us to put it into the calendar? Because um, it seems like they just appreciate that. Um, and then we review any sort of communication problems with their driver manager. This is the operations manager reaching out. So um, if there's a conflict between the driver and the driver manager, it's not pushed back till the sixth or seventh week when the driver's ready to, you know, walk out the door. Um, we address it right away. You know, three weeks is enough time for them to kind of get to know each other and kind of, um, you know, build a relationship. And then if it's not working, we can swoop in and just and make that change and assign them to somebody else. So that's been really valuable too. Excellent. Um, and then we go into week four, um, and that's our recruiting week. Uh, the recruiter that hired the driver reaches back out to the driver and just point blank asks, did, did I keep my promises that I told you? Um, when we talked and we hired you, am I, am I keeping up with our end? Are you getting paid what you want to get paid? You know, the miles that I said that you were going to make, are you making them? And this kind of gives an opportunity not only for the recruiter, but just, you know, they've been here a month now. There's a lot of little things that can happen, and she just kind of summarizes everything. Um, the recruiting department works under me, and so we're kind of the champions of this program. So this is our opportunity to, to kind of go back and double check that if there's anything on that email that we feel hasn't been resolved, this is our time to make sure that it's, it's happening because now they've been here for 30 days. Um, and then we go into week five, which is our safety department. Um, our, we call. Uh, the very first thing we do, as everybody knows, sometimes safety kind of gets a bad rap for being kind of the negative Nelly in the room, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So we really try and, um, you know, spin it really positive to make sure that they understand that, like, uh, you're, you're not in trouble because most of the time that's the, the uh, response that we get is, uh oh, what did I do? So 
So the very first thing we say is, hey, we're just calling to check up on you. We want to let you know um, on what date you're eligible for your first safety bonus. And that kind of opens up the door to conversation, and we start from there. Um, our experience over the last year, which I know Kelly and I are going to talk about the, you know, the hurdles that we had, um, we, we installed cameras, and it was um, a difficult transi transition. So that's one of the things that we added to our touch points. Let's talk to the driver about the cameras. Do they understand? Do they feel comfortable? Are we sure they understand how they work um, and when they're actually you know, being recorded and that type of stuff? And we have found over the last probably four or five months that about 80% of the drivers didn't understand how the cameras worked. So not only was it just helping one driver individually, we were able to go back and look at our entire company policy and how we were training them to be like, okay, we need to we need to fix the communication on day one, so we're not waiting until you know week five to find this this communication breakdown. Um, and then of course we review any sort of just safety issues or questions that they have. So um, and it's obviously um, you know an individual case by case situation. And then week six is kind of our final follow up. Um, it falls right in where um, our guys are getting pretty close to being eligible for benefits. We talk about extra programs and incentives that we have for drivers. Um, and then this is the time that our department goes back through the entire six weeks worth of the email chain just to make sure that everything is, you know, all the boxes are checked, all the T's are crossed, and that everybody's just, um, you know, happy. And by then, usually the drivers are so receptive to talking to us that even if there is an issue, they're already coming in and talking to people because they know that we're already open to it and kind of receptive to it. So it sounds like a lot of work, um, and it is. It is a lot of work, but it's totally worth it because it's opening up all these doors that we've never seen before. We have a really strict protocol on how to maintain these touch points. Um, we have these emails that go out. We have a schedule that's built. It's basically a spreadsheet. Like I was telling Kelly, we went through a couple different designs um, before we kind of came up with something that was easy to read. But still, even after all that work that we put into it, it's minimal compared to all the work that we would have to do to hire all the turn, you know, all the turnover drivers that we would have had. So it's definitely well worth it. Um, these spreadsheets go out to all the department managers every two weeks. We hold them accountable to make sure that they do their touch points. And then we have discussions in, in the managers' meetings if they're not getting done. And what has kind of happened and what's evolved over the last couple of months is we don't, we don't shin kick anymore. We don't point fingers at departments. If there's an issue with a department, every single manager knows about it, and no one's going, well, yeah, you know, dispatch, they do that. It's, hey, what can I do to help? Or, hey, you know, Let's, let's get them connected with this driver because I think it'll solve it. And really, a lot of that anim animosity has really kind of gone away in between our department managers. I know Kelly was talking about that, but we're, we're kind of living proof of it. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a huge change in our dynamic with our management team, and we weren't really expecting it. This is kind of a positive spinoff of it. Absolutely. Hey, by the way, so, uh, in, in, if you can't, quote it off the top of your head, then, then I can help. But uh, one question that's been asked is, what formula are you using to get turnover numbers? So um, we actually use, we're, we're doing, we do a rolling 12. Um, so we take the number of um, full trucks divided by the number of terms. Um, so it, because it's a rolling 12, like this month, any terms that happen 12 months from now have already fallen off, so we, recal we basically recalculate it every week. But it's the number of full trucks divided by um, the number of term drivers. Or did you say it backwards? I did say it backwards. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. The number, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. The, number of, the number of terms. Go ahead. Yeah, the number of terms divided by the, the full trucks that we have. There it so, is. And, you know, again, another learning curve. We have some teams that kind of skewed the numbers. Um, so you really got to sit down and look at it and make sure that you are uh, accounting for teams. And if you have slip seating, um, basically it's the filled positions that, that we use as the calculation. 
Right. I mean, real simple. Here, here at the end of the year, you can look at how many drivers did you lose this year. Divide that by the average number of drivers on your fleet. Right. Boom, there's your turnover rate. Yeah. Uh, I was very um, analytical about it uh, when I was over recruiting at CFI 20 years ago. And where I, my schedule was every day. I mean, literally, I would look at how many drivers did I lose um, so far this year. Then I would divide that by the number of days that, I, that I'd used that year. Then I'd multiply it by 365 Wow. And then divide that by our number of, of drivers, you know. So then I could, so that was one. Then the other, of course, you could look how many did I lose today, multiply that by 365, divide it by your total number of drivers. There's just so many ways to slice and dice it, uh, so that you can, what it tells you is how am I doing, how am I trending, and, you know, from, from looking rearward, but also if I continued my current behavior, how am I trending going forward? Right. And so I had several different ways that I, I sliced it. Um, something else that I recommend is that people look at at your core, and and that's the drivers that you know stay that are with you prior you know more than six months, more than a year, more than five years, more than ten. You know our turnover happens in the bottom twenty percent of our fleet. So if you so how many what's your turnover in the first ninety days? And the reason that Amanda saw so much um, results so quickly is because the things we're talking about start these folks off on the right foot, and it identifies the turnover um, or the drivers with issues before it becomes turnover. And and so since we all know 75% of turnover happens in the first 90 days of employment, uh, when doing these things, address those people, got them on the path with us, got them committed to us, and it started lowering that turnover. And lo and behold, you have just a phenomenal result. So the other thing, as we talked about, you know, I said earlier on, find out what successful people are doing and replicate it. And so she's sharing it with you. Well, part of what this whole strategic touch point is about, when you think about the drivers that have been with your company for a long time, they are connected to your company. They, they are not concerned with calling safety because they know safety. They know the shop manager. They know payroll. So what this system does is it systemizes that connection and multiple connections throughout the company. If that driver's only connection to the company is through his, through his fleet manager, it is super simple for them to feel disconnected and then to park that line. You know, I think about it for, as, as mooring a ship to the dock. You know, when I was in the Coast Guard, you put a bow line on, a stern line on, a spring, you know, forward spring, a rear spring, and you know what? In foul weather, you double them up. Well, how do we do that with people? When I think about the people that have been with our company for a long time, we have lots of lines connected to those people between that driver and, hey, what about to the spouse and to the family? You know, what if uh, when medical benefits is about to kick in, what if the uh, medical benefits administrator reaches out and says, hey, would you like me to call your spouse? And so now we've got a connection to the family. What if the fleet manager... Uh, sends a birthday or, or a fleet manager or, or whoever, send a, you typically it's fleet manager, send a birthday card uh, to the to the the child of, of the driver. What about an anniversary card? You know, here's something that's happened recently, and Amanda, this has kind of come up since you and I worked together. Um, that whole get-to-know-you sheet of paper that the fleet manager, the, com- the, uh, the, the uh, conversation that the fleet manager has uh, with the driver at orientation, um, what if you added questions on there like, what's your favorite snack? What's your favorite um, beverage, non-alcoholic beverage? You know, what um, what a restaurant do you and your, fam- does you, you and your family and or spouse um, like to frequent? Once you have that information, what if, come the driver's um, um, anniversary, what if you send an anniversary card and enclosed a gift card to their favorite restaurant? It shows you care. Um, I've got some couple of fleets that are doing these concierge um, services. One of, one, one of my clients, their drivers pull into the fuel island. When they come in, they get a handover, uh, anything that's wrong with the truck, 
and they get out of the truck and go home. The company fuels it, drops the trailer, and when they come back on Sunday, the trailer is hooked up with bills of lading in the seat for the load that they're expecting, and it's ready to go for them. Uh, another one of my clients has created a uh, kind of a concierge service in the driver's lounge, and so they have a person, and this person is getting to know the drivers, and so um, when they see John coming, they know that he likes Mountain Dew. So when he walks in the door, they're greeting him with a cold Mountain Dew. Hey, John, welcome back. How you doing? And so they're, and they have snacks, and they're serving their, um, they're serving their drivers when they come in, and just welcome them home. How you doing, man? Have, have this, have this beverage, have this snack type thing. So just looking for ways to make them feel important and appreciated because they serve sacrifice a lot on behalf of us. And guys, I'm going to hit that for just a second. I was speaking recently at a conference, and a, uh, a TCA driver of the year, Murray, was there on the panel. And we were, I was, you know, asking questions of different panelists. And I asked Murray, Murray, can you can you share, you know, you know, the sacrifices that you make as a driver? And, and folks, and by the way, I just picked up an, an echo. I don't know what that's about. But Murray, who was answering every question, just boom, totally clear. The echo's gone. Totally clear, no problem. I asked him about sacrifices he makes as a driver, and he could not answer it. Anybody that was on that webinar, we had that live. Anybody in the audience knows exactly what I'm talking about. That was, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't have to dig deep to find a nerve. It was right there on the surface, and I didn't mean to find it. I did not mean for it to be a nerve, but emotion just flowed. Guys, our drivers sacrifice a lot of time away from their family. They miss a lot of super important events that you and I take for, for, take for granted while they're out there doing this job. We need to show our appreciation. Um, hey, be, uh, so I've got a, uh, another question here. Uh, what about voluntary versus involuntary terms in the turnover number? Absolutely, you can you can break that out. You have your total turnover, then you have you know hey here's here's then you separate them out. What's voluntary and what's involuntary? I typically find uh, that it's that involuntary is about safety related turnover is typically about twenty percent of turnover. Uh, Amanda, would you have anything to comment on that as well? Yeah, I would agree with that. That that's about where where we're at now. Um, and yeah. we do in in our in our transparent emails that we send to you know company wide. Um, if it's a if if it's a um, voluntary term, like if someone retires or you know somebody moved away with their family or whatever, we're really you know we we let the staff know like, hey guys, we didn't do anything wrong this week or you know we're we're doing good, but so and so had a you know, move to take care of his aunt or, or whatever. So, um, we're again, we're very transparent about it, and um, I would I would agree about 20% is usually safety related. So, yeah. and, but I, I would I want to this is a whole other seminar entitled How to Modify Driver Behavior. Yeah. But folks, one of the problems, okay, and, and typically when I look at turnover rate, about 20% is safety related. But here's one of the challenges we have in trucking. Most of our corrective action when it comes to DOT violations and accidents and other behavior is all reactive as well. I, I was listening to some safety directors at a safety conference recently, and they're sitting around the table talking, and uh, they're like, yeah, when our drivers, you know, if he has an accident, I assign this. Oh, if he gets a log violation, I assign that. And I'm sitting there thinking, I was at a, a table next to them. They, had no, they didn't realize I was the next speaker talking about modifying driver behavior. The problem with everything I heard talked about in that group was everything was reactive. The problem is you're already wearing the accident. You already have the CSA violation. Why don't we assign uh, e-learning proactively rather than reactively? Let's try to stop these events before they happen in the first place. And I've seen my fleets that are doing that are lowering the involuntary resignation by at least half. And that's another uh, area to attack in, in driver turnover. So here's a good question. Thank you, Janice, for this. What do you do, Amanda? <laughs> what do you do when the driver gets annoyed by the calls every week? Well, first off, they're not necessarily – well, I guess yours kind of do lay out every week, but um, they're not always every week. But have you ever had a driver get yeah. forked off and say, hey, 
don't call me. Go ahead. Yeah, I have. We have, and that's it's a that's a great question because it uh, it definitely happens. Um, we have a couple curmudgeons out there that are like, "Why are you calling me every week?" Um, and and basically, um, we have that discussion on the phone and say, "Hey, this is just our policy. Here's what we'll do instead. Um, we're going to reach out to you next week. We'll reach out to you via PeopleNet, and um, we're going to send you you know an email to your truck and make sure that you're okay." So even if they don't want to talk to us, we still send a message out and says, hey, this is so-and-so from this department. We're reaching out to you, making sure everything's okay. We're, we're still trying our best to, you know, to reach out to them, but, but it's a good point, and it does happen. Uh, the other thing that we do, too, and I kind of skipped over it, but when, when we're in orientation, every department manager comes in and speaks for just a few minutes, and we hand them our card, and we say, hey, by the way, we're going to be reaching out to you in a couple of weeks, or I'm going to reach out to you in two weeks, or you know, whenever your turn is. And um, so they they kind of know. Uh, maybe some people probably don't believe us that we're going to do that, but we do, and um, that kind of helps too. And and I'll tell you, just because I I am the safety department, our our biggest our biggest hurdle is is getting the drivers to call back the safety department because they're like, I'm not calling them back. I don't know what I did, or you know. So that's our biggest hurdle. And again, we evolved. Um, you know, the manager before says, "Hey, by the way, safety is going to be calling you next week. So if you have questions about your safety bonus or whatever, they'll talk. They'll talk to you about it." And if we have a driver that says, "You know, back off. I don't. I don't need to be talking to you guys all the way. You know, I get enough calls from my driver manager." We just say, "Okay, we'll shoot you a message, and we'll, we'll put our email in it. If you have questions, you you know, you call us, you email us, um, whatever." But I can say those guys that you know did say, "I don't want, I don't want you to call us." We we didn't lose them. We still did everything we could to say we're here. You know, just if you need us, we're here. And, and I, I would, um, would you also say that is a minority? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say yeah. probably. I don't know. I think I've had this year total maybe three guys. You know, three drivers say that. Yeah. So. And so, guys, let's treat people based on who they are, not who somebody else was. I, 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 I just could see somebody saying. You know what? They're going to get all torqued off when you you call them up there. All those phone calls. Really, somebody's going to get call is going to get mad because you called and you care. Right. Well, mm-hmm. I guess we had three. Yeah. So and, and, let's deal with. And they're still there, by the way. She hasn't yeah. lost those guys. Go ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to say, a lot of guys don't really want to talk. You know, I mean, they they're not going to go into all these details. A lot. I get. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. All right. That's why you're calling. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I'm good. Everything's great. And then. That's it. We move on. You know, I mean, it's not yep. it's not always this big, you know, detailed thing where we're spending an hour on the phone. It can take me five minutes just to reach out to my driver that week. Um, you know, every, like Kelly said, every, everybody's different. Everybody has a different um, attitude about it. So. And, 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 you know, you said an important, important thing there. We're not talking about um, a lot of time here. You're only contacting the new drivers. And by the way, how much time does it take to replace them if you lose them? Yeah. And here's the, here's how I want to ask this. Um, so, are you finding that that the drivers and we're getting short on time? We have seven minutes. But um, are you finding that the drivers that they communicate more with you that they, they feel more comfortable coming in, yes. talking? Yes, absolutely. So, in fact, we just yeah. finished our annual driver survey, and um, one of the things one of the things that we ask is open ended questions: <clears throat> What's our company doing right? And we had a majority of the drivers say, it's really nice to be able to walk in and talk to somebody. So Good deal. You know, a question was just sent, and uh, man, we've got, I love these questions. Was it, how did you get the rest of the company to, to decide to work with you on this new approach? I want to answer this two ways um, for, the, for the person. First, um, when I was at CFI, um, you know, we didn't have a seminar that, that, that kicked this off, and I identified that this would, you know, 75% of turnover happens in the first 90 days, and if I was to proactively contact these folks, I could probably reduce our turnover rate. So I didn't worry about what other departments would do or not do. I did it myself with my recruiting department, and we lowered the turnover rate 27%. The other departments were willing to help if we contacted them with the problem, but they did, they weren't making the proactive phone calls. The other, what happened here is, is their president. Uh, invested in a group seminar. And so everybody in the company experienced the seminar that I conducted with Stuart. And um, everybody in the company agreed to it with the strategic touch points and with the 
um, with the action items. Here's what's funny. At the end of the seminar, they said, uh, we asked, I asked, you know, hey, how much do we want to lower the turnover rate? And it was, it was decided 50%. And then it was asked, well, how long? And the president said, uh, 90 days. And I said, sir, I believe you are smoking weed. <laughs> yes, Amanda, I said it. Amanda, did I say that? You did. You did. <laughs> and then I got very nervous. <laughs> you know, I hadn't been paid yet. <laughs> and I was glad that he laughed and everybody in the company laughed. But I want to tell you, it was one of the most intense. And, it, oh, it got emotional. When, when, and, and Colin stood up, Colin the president, Colin Stewart stood up at the end in his closing marks, and he says, you know, Kelly, I said 90 days, and you didn't think we could do it. He says, what you don't understand is you don't know my people. I still remember that, Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Colin's passion for his team. He said, these folks can do it. I've got the best people in the industry. And guys, I'm going to tell you, he ain't wrong. He said, I said 90 days because I know they can do it and they put their head to it. But you know what? The team stood up and said, sir, we, can't, we, we just don't think we can do it in 90, but sir, we'll do it for you in six months. And they did it. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, and real quick, um, and we'll try to get a couple questions as we go, what hurt and what helped you? I mean, sure. there's, there's been challenges. Yeah. Um, our two biggest challenges, we implemented cameras, like I said before. Um, that was that, that was it hurt us. We we had drivers leave over it. Um, it was a hard communication campaign, but we got through it. Um, I recommend staying away from you know big changes like that. But it was our time to do that, so we just did it. Um, and then also keeping people focused, our staff, mainly non-manager people. Um, I we we got to find ways to motivate people in the shop, our dispatchers, our schedulers. Why why does our appointment schedulers care if you know we have high turnover? The seminar helped, um, constant communication. We've empowered our employees to be able to recognize drivers anytime they want. It doesn't matter who it is. Uh, we give away gift cards um, to the truck stop down the street. Um, any staff has access to them, and if they see a driver doing something good or you know, maybe they help the staff member out, any driver can just walk up and say, hey, thanks, you know, we really appreciate it. And once we started getting people involved at a different level, it kind of you know, went, went from there. Um, and you have to do it every week. You have to send that email every week. People will get complacent. It's just kind of human nature. Um, so my, my biggest advice is find champions like within your company, not just in the HR department. Go to your accounting manager. If you have a good relationship with one of your shop managers and say, hey, look, this is going to work out for us all. It's going to help. You know, my shop guys are like, hey, we're not turning trucks over as fast, um, you know, because people aren't jumping in and out of them our driver managers aren't having to train drivers and, you know, do all that kind of stuff and um, find people and explain to them, like, this is for the company. And if you just have a couple people behind you, including executive level management, um, you, you'll do it. You'll, it takes a while. Um, but, again, the time you put into it is not even close to the time it takes to replace those drivers. Absolutely. Um, it was it was asked. Can you clarify the driver trainer's role? Let me answer this real quick for you. I am all about and, and Amanda, maybe you can kick into. We are on the short list here on time, but um, they have, this company has six to seven different representatives uh, coming in and talking to the drivers and orientation folks. Every time I see uh, an orientation, it, we do it for the purpose that they get an exposure to different t departments. The downside is every time I see that, there's a lot of sitting around and waiting for the next presenter, and there's lots of repetition. Uh, and frankly, people hear more how they can get fired than they can stay employed. We are all about uh, having – I'm all about, Amanda, do you agree, having yes. one yep. orientation instructor? Yep. Yeah, it's been a game changer for us, and it, it took a lot of work. We We got into it. Um, each manager helped the driver trainer build their portion, build their department. Um, they sat through three or four orientations to make sure that they were getting the message, you know, that they wanted to hear. Um, but now it runs so smooth. It's such a good investment. And, um, you know, our managers still come in. But instead of spending an hour and a half, and like Kelly said, the driver's waiting around, they come in, they shake everybody's hand, maybe they sit down for a couple minutes, and, 
and kind of build that relationship and then and then it's done it's it's a good investment and um we really thrived from it this year to have that one point of contact excellent hey anna uh, call me and i'll answer your question i'm not sure which uh, she said would you please share your quote about uh drivers again and I don't know which one she's referring to. I have lots of quotes. <laughs> but one is treat people based on who they are, not who somebody else is, if that's what I was referring to. But otherwise, give me a call, Anna, and we'll we'll figure out which one I talked about, and I'll give you uh, that one and others. Uh, Man Alive, one more. So the driver trainer sits through the orientation with the new driver, kind of like a buddy right from the start. No, the driver trainer is actually teaching the class. Yeah. We're all about a, a single orientation instructor. They're a professional at teaching the class. Uh, but when you do the when you do the tour, there's a couple things you can do. When you do the tour, make sure that everybody first off be the first to show themselves friendly. Guys, put a smile on your face. Take off that elevator face. Number two, any department head and such that is available, we're walking by doing the tour early in orientation, not at the end. Early in orientation, and let's shake hands, introduce people. And there's other people. I just say the VP of Operations, President, whomever. When any time you can walk in the classroom, walk in. I'll put on hold what I'm doing, and let's have a few words from this person. Hey, with that man alive, Amanda, we have run out of time. Uh, I do not take lightly uh, the, the opportunity uh, to share this with you, and Amanda, your sharing to the industry, what you guys have done at Stewart, and um, folks, Higher Right is just phenomenal. I am so proud to be. Uh, affiliate and be able to offer uh, this type of a program and giving me giving us the opportunity to do that. Kent, Sharon, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Kelly and Amanda, certainly we thank you for providing such a very informative session and for your time and thank you to the attendees that uh, took time out of your busy day to uh, listen to this webinar. Uh, for those of you that had questions that we were unable to address, we'll respond back to you via email, and uh, please remember to take the short survey. Thank you for attending, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.